Greetings, everyone, and welcome to R. Kelly Appeal TV. Today, we are discussing the topic of Robert Sylvester Kelly and the federal Chicago trial in Illinois that took place today. And we're going to go over a few details that I think is pertinent to the R. Kelly Appeal TV channel. I do apologize for having technical difficulties earlier. My live, it did not go well. I tried it twice and I do apologize, but today this will be up and available to you. And from this point on, I will be doing premieres. So feel free to be able to tap into the live with your comments and just know that I won't be able to respond to them immediately except through text. So what we're gonna do today is go over a few um, key points that is going to be historical for the Chicago um, federal trial that took place for the jury selection. Now, August the 14th, which was yesterday, attorney Jennifer Bonjean, she filed a motion in order to um, remove some of the jurors who have possibly been able to see the, the R. Kelly, surviving R. Kelly docuseries. Well, I don't know how true it is, but according to Chicago Times, and this was earlier today, about 1.54 p.m., they stated that the um, judge denied that opportunity for the defense in order to remove the jurors who have been part of the docuseries. They're basically saying that everyone in America has already seen or heard of the docuseries. So we're going to go a little bit deeper today, but I want you to really stay focused and open and expand your thought process in what is going on with this case. There is an issue of double jeopardy um, that we see as double jeopardy, but as far as the government is concerned, because there is a new component to the 2008 case, which is obstruction of, just, of uh, obstruction, which created chaos in order for the individuals to participate in that trial now makes it non-double jeopardy. So I want you to understand what that is all about. We may not want to hear that, but here's the catch. If it is a problem, it will be found in the wash when the appeal takes place. But let's try to get him through this federal um, part of Chicago and just get him whatever he is going to get. So that will be the worst case scenario. So then we'll be able to go back to the the onset and, and begin again. So let's listen to this video footage of the jury selection from NBC today. This was um, presented today on NBC News. Here we go. I think that's from the beginning. And, and those even who were captivated by the documentary Surviving R. Kelly, which for a lot of people was the first time they were seeing these allegations and hearing from the women's families. I mean, it seems like there are all these different trials, right? We've seen Illinois, we've seen New York, then there was that state trial from 2008. Is oh, yeah. that playing a role in this trial now? And if so, what is the connection between the two? In theory, it shouldn't play a role because a jury is told, don't consider any of the other things you've heard about R. Kelly only judge him on these uh, crimes that he's charged with. But realistically, R. Kelly's been charged in courts all over the country, mm -hmm. state and federal. So the jury has to be considering that on some level. And indeed, just knowing about his other legal problems doesn't disqualify them as jurors. It's The question is whether or not the jury, in light of what they know about R. Kelly, can still be fair and impartial. But I mean, that is going to be a challenge uh, for any defense attorney to seat a jury in these cases because He's just had so much negative publicity. Uh, and again, the 2008 case is was an acquittal, and yet you're still having some of the same allegations, the same conduct coming into this case, which is an interesting double jeopardy issue. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised if they try to raise that on appeal if this is a conviction. Mm. All right, NBC News legal analyst Annie Savalas for us there. Danny, as always, thank you. So that's what I wanted you to do. That's what I wanted you to hear because that is very vital, is very important that you heard them, you heard that attorney say that specifically the appeal part is going to have to be put into motion because there are some things there that is going to have to be broken down and revisited. So I wanted to let you know about that. The next thing on the agenda today is to talk about the filing we're going to we're going to we're going to hear the motion filing 
that Jennifer Bonjean used today in this seven page document filed August 14th, 2022. So let me put my phone on, do not disturb, and here we go. United States of America plaintiff versus Robert Sylvester Kelly, AKA R. Kelly, Daryl McDavid, and Milton Brown, also known as June Brown. Defending Kelly's motion to excuse for cause, potential jurors who have seen any portion of the docuseries surviving R. Kelly. Now comes Robert Sylvester Kelly, defended by and through his counsel, Jennifer Bonjean, and respectfully files this motion to excuse all potential jurors who have watched any portion of the docuseries surviving R. Kelly. Now there's a footnote, and the footnote says, for the purpose of this motion, Kelly seeks to incorporate the surviving R. Kelly docuseries, which can be streamed on Netflix. So, Surviving R. Kelly, where the docuseries number one explores the exact allegations that underscore this indictment, including Kelly's 2008 prosecution for child pornography of minor one. Number two includes intensive interviews with several individuals expected to testify at this trial. And number three contains numerous allegations of others' misconduct that is not and will not be introduced during this trial. Any potential juror who has watched any portion of this docuseries must be disqualified for cause, irrespective of whether he or she believes he or she can be fair. Where too great a risk exists that such a juror would base his or her verdict on matters not introduced into evidence in the courtroom. So she's trying to paint the picture and say that these individuals are not going to be fair. They're going to be biased. They're going to be impartial, especially if they are emotionally drawn to the testimony of these, these women, these supposed victims in the case. So let's go through number one. Surviving R. Kelly is a lifetime documentary dealing Sexual abuse allegations by numerous women against the defendant. It aired January 2019 and was Lifetime's highest rated program in two years. In January 2020, a second season premiered on Lifetime titled Surviving R. Kelly 2. The reckoning surviving R. Kelly is largely credited as the impetus for the wave of criminal charges that followed its premiere. So basically what happened is the same thing that happened in the federal Brooklyn trial where they hurried up and they gathered information in order to find and hold something under his name. For example, they should have waited for the docuseries to take place after this trial process had been completed. But since they hurried up and done that, they prematurely um, created a, this, this fiasco of, of information that is going to taint everyone's point of view of Robert. And then it moves to the federal Brooklyn trial when they had to hurry up and indict in order to convict, in order to sentence before Chicago. And Chicago will have place over Minnesota and it goes, you know, whatever else they choose to want to do. All of this will be revisited in the appeal but it's going to take some time because they are gridlocking the opportunity for Bonjean to do what she does best for her client. But again, at least thank God we have that overflow of um, an opportunity after this is all said and done, along with the hung jury that my one guy who is part of the R. Kelly Appeal TV channel continually believes will be a... Um, uh, ram in a bush for the Chicago trial that began today, of course, the jury selection. And, and this is what the motion was that she filed yesterday. Now, I'm not sure, like I said, if Chicago some, sometimes is a, um, fair and true, um, if the information is correct, but according to them, they said that the, the judge denied, and I'll put that clip up here. The judge denied the, um, the motion, but I'm not sure. So I'm going to continue to read it as though it is until it's on the docket. When I see it on the docket, we'll read the motion that Lennon Weber put down. Number two, the docuseries devotes significant attention, indeed entire 
episodes to the subject matter of this trial. For example, episode three is titled Sex Tape Scandal, which explores the sex tape that was the subject of Kelly's 2008 prosecution. Relatedly, episode four is titled The People versus R. Kelly, which addresses the 2008 prosecution and allegations related to the first eight counts of this superseding indictment. So they're putting the jurors in a higher ranking position to know more about the situation than what they're going to present in court. That's the reason why the prosecution is saying that they're not going to bring Jim Dare Goddess in. Why? Because he doesn't need to be brought in. All the information is right there on the table for him. You know, if you've heard anything about surviving R. Kelly, you're going to know about Jim Dare Goddess. So there's no need to bring him in. Prosecution doesn't have to. So that's that's double standard to 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 the um, sanctuary of putting information out so that others could be fair and impartial and unbiased. Number three, <clears throat> indeed, the docu series contains extensive interviews with some of the government's witnesses in this case, including Lisa Van Allen and Jeronda Pace. Other individuals who appear in the docuseries are identified as potential witnesses in this matter, including Stephanie Sparkle Edwards and Andrea Kelly. There is a substantial overlap between the subject matter of this prosecution and the subject matter of the documentary. Now, mind you, Andrea Kelly was not part of the 2008 case. So why is she even there now? And this is what they're saying is going to overlap. And the subject matter is going to be confused to the jury in a way that they're not going to know what was the presentation from prosecution or what they knew about the case from the very beginning. And this is what Bonjean is saying. And this is why she feels that a juror who has watched the docuseries should not be entitled to be a part of this jury selection. Number four, furthermore, Surviving R. Kelly contains hours of interviews with individuals who share a litany of other allegations of sexual misconduct against Kelly, including some allegations that the government has already conceded it will not introduce at trial. Just by the way of example, the docuseries discusses allegations against Kelly in connection with his relationship with Aaliyah when she was underage. So they're going to bring the dead back to go before the trial, the same trial that happened in 2008 and nothing came about Aaliyah in this situation. But they're gonna try to assume that these people are straight, uh, treacherously scared of R. Kelly that even Aaliyah was silenced and muted. This is what Bonjean is saying is unfair and impartial to her client. In response to Kelly's motion in Lamine, the government has already conceded that it will not introduce evidence related to the allegations surrounding Kelly's relationship with Aaliyah. Why should they? They're already talking about it. They already are talking about it. They know this. This court acknowledged the government's concession, finding Kelly's motion moot in a light of government's position on this issue. Any juror who watched the docuseries would be privy to such information that has already been excluded as at this trial. So she's saying, you know, these are things that they're going to run into if they watch the docuseries. Number five, in light of the foregoing, there is no scenario under which any individual who watched Surviving R. Kelly could be qualified as a juror. In this case, whether the person admits it or not, any person who has Seeing the documentary would possess information about the allegations in this indictment and unrelated allegations that would unquestionably interfere with his or her ability to decide the case based on the evidence that is introduced at trial. No one, even a well-intentioned person, would be capable of purging his brain of information obtained through the docuseries or separating information learned from the documentary that was never subject to cross-examination from testimony introduced at trial on the same subject matter. So how are you going to be able to connect the two and disassociate the two while 
putting your verdict down as guilty or not guilty. You're not going to be able to do it. You're not going to be able to, to, to share that you honestly did this for the purpose of knowing that you're going to be unbiased. There's no one on that court jury selection or panel that would be able to say that they could possibly do that. And this is what Bonjean is saying here. So why the judge would strike this down is be knowing to me, other than the fact that he's like, pick it up and pick it up and appeal. I'm just getting through it. Number six, the sixth amendment provides that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a trial by an impartial jury, U.S. constitutional, U.S. constitution amendment. One touchstone of a fair trial is an impartial trier of fact. A jury capable and willing to decide the case solely on the evidence before it. Look at McDonough Power Equipment versus Greenberg, Greenwood. In 1984, a jury is not impartial if his experiences, opinions, dispositions, biases, prejudice, interests, or relationships would prevent or substantially impair the performance of his duties as a juror in the accordance with the instruction of his oath. Wayne Wright versus Witt, 1985. Number seven, not only must potential jurors with actual bias be excused for cause, but courts have found that when circumstances create too great a risk of affecting a juror's decisions making process, even if the juror is not consciously fully aware of the impact, a juror must be excused. Crawford versus US, 1909. Holding that the law says that with regard to some of the relations which may exist between the juror and one of the parties, bias is implied and evidence of its actual existence need not be given. See Smith versus Phillips, 1982. Determining whether a juror is biased or has per perjured a case is difficult, partly because the juror may have an interest in concealing his own bias and partly because the juror may be unaware of it. See Hunley versus uh, Godinez in 1992, recognizing presumed bias in extreme situations where the, for example, the prospective juror is connected to the litigation in such a way that it is highly unlikely that he or she could act impartially during deliberations. Number eight, this type of bias is called implied or presumed bias and is determined as a matter of law and attributed to prospective juror regardless of actual partiality. Jurors are considered impartial so long as they can consciously and properly carry out their sworn duty to apply to the law the facts of a particular case, according to Ross versus Oklahoma in 1988. A request to excuse a juror for cause may be supported by specific cause or reason that demonstrate that as matter of law, the juror is not qualified to serve. Gray versus Mississippi, 1987. In certain circumstances, jury bias will be presumed and the jury must be excluded. For example, where the juror is related to one of the parties or has a financial interest in the outcome of the case. U.S. versus Polishemy, 2000. Number nine, in this case, a potential juror who has seen any portion of surviving R. Kelly is actually prejudice where there is simply no scenario under which an individual exposed to the contents of surviving R. Kelly can be impartial. Some potential jurors in this case who have com com completed the questionnaires acknowledge as much, but some potential jurors who have been, who have seen the documentary have indicated that they are still capable of being impartial. The representation in a word is absurd. Number 10, this case presents one of those rare circumstances where bias must pres be presumed by individuals who have seen surviving R. Kelly because the viewers have already gained an understanding of the specific facts in this case through television interviews with actual witnesses. Footnote, just by way of example, the following clip is a portion of extension interviews from surviving R. Kelly with the one of the state star witnesses, Lisa Van Allen. It is difficult to imagine that any juror would be equipped to listen to Lisa Van Allen's testimony with an impartial viewpoint and without allowing prior information received during the documentary to shade her assessment of Van Allen 
in court testimony. This is precisely the scenario. Even the best intentioned individual would invariably view a witness's testimony from the witness stand through a lens of whatever bias he or she developed after watching that same individual provide her account during a television interview. Number 11, to be, to be clear, this is not a simple matter of a juror being exposed to negative pretrial publicity. Indeed, every prospective juror in this case has probably been exposed in some negative pretrial publicity about Kelly. Rather, this is an issue of potential jurors possessing a mountain of information about the specific allegations in this case and the witnesses' stories that will play center stage at this time and may or may not be admissible, allowing an individual to sit on this jury who has seen surviving R. Kelly is no different than allowing a, ju a jury to sit on the jury who was permitted to preview the discovery in the, in, in the case. So they're saying that you're giving them all the ammunition. They know too much. They're not gonna be able to be fair and impartial. Number 12, in a conventional criminal case in which the jury is asked only whether guilt has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, the bias or prejudice of even single jurors would violate a defendant's right to a fair trial. So he's not going to be able to get a fair trial. That's basically what the judge just said. I'm not going to let you allow him to get a fair trial in my courtroom. <laughs> Especially if he denied this motion. Now, I'm not sure because it's not on the docket. So don't take what I'm saying as face value that Chicago Sun-Times stated that literally they said it's rejected, denied, okay? When it's on the motion, we'll read it and we'll give the specifics of why it is denied or accepted, okay? 13. Thus, this court should excuse for all cause potential jurors who have seen portions of surviving R. Kelly and those potential jurors who have been exposed to pretrial publicity about this case must be scrutinized and questioned to determine whether they are capable of serving as an impartial witness. And that is the certificate of service by Jennifer Bonjean filed the motion to exclude for a cause all potential jurors who have watched surviving R. Kelly and this was done August 14, 2022. All parties have been served in this scenario. So what are your thoughts? I mean, I literally tried to go on two times to do a live and I did it randomly at times where, okay, you guys didn't know I was gonna be on, but it would have been waiting for you after work, after school, somehow or another, Everyone seems to have technical difficulties on YouTube at this point, unless you are one of those top people who are pushing propaganda that does not relate to what we're talking about here. So I guess this is not the type of news that they expect to be out there on the top levels of YouTube, okay? And I understand it. I so get it. Um, but this is why I'm doing my pre-recording because I expect that you get the information fairly and, and thoroughly. And I'm not worried about trying to figure out what's buffering, what's not, what's right, what's wrong. Can you hear me? Can you not? And then other distractions. And this is how I started my our Kelly Appeal TV. It was always started pre-record. And then someone asked, well, when are you going to go live? And I never had went live. So then I decided that I was going to take that time in order to get to know my, my listeners and my subscribers. However, if you're going to be a subscriber to the R. Kelly Appeal TV, you're doing it for the information. You're not doing it whether I'm live or whether I'm, I'm pre-recorded. So basically, you'll receive more pre-recorded information. It'll always be around 6 p.m., so um, please make you know that note available that this is what we do, and especially on Sundays. That's our major day where I'm always on. So if you don't ever see me on during the week, which I doubt it, 
You always see me saying something, doing something pre-recorded. You will definitely catch me at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time here at R. Kelly Appeal TV. September 1st, we're going to be starting our, our members only portion and we're going to go over to Patreon. We're going to move outside of uh, YouTube and maybe we'll get a better platform um, acceptance, you know, because it'll be, you know, smaller um, groups and it'll be less, you know, inferences. But yeah, I needed to put that motion out there. I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope that it made some sense of when, even if the judge, you know, some people are saying he's very unfair. Um, so basically what I want to also put on this video is, I got to find my um, picture. In the Chicago Tribune, August 15th, 2022, there was breaking news at 1.54 p.m. that judge denies request to remove prospective jurors who've seen surviving R. Kelly. So I don't know if that is, again, Chicago's way of, you know, just throwing out the, the, uh, the energy or if it's real because the motion has not been filed as of yet to put that on the docket. Um, so I'm just saying, let's just hold that and work on what Bonjean is working on right now and seeing how this is going to play out. Again, let it play out. Let's not lose faith that this thing can be whatever it's going to be, okay? We'll see the big elephant in the room and we'll recognize it's the big elephant and then we'll move into the appeal portion of how we're going to move the elephant out the room. Are we going to use the bu the bulldozer to lift the, the room up in order to allow the elephant to walk out in clear and free? Or do we break the elephant down, you know? <laughs> do we break the elephant down and take a leg out, uh, you know, one by one or the trunk out, you know what I mean? So we have to be very, very careful in how we're going to put this in our mindset. Of course, lift the room up and allow the elephant to roam free. Do not try to incarcerate and incorporate and, and to the avail of, of losing the elephant do we recognize that the elephant must leave the room, okay? He needs support. Robert needs support. He needs the counseling. He needs the support that obviously he needed in 2008. That's it in a nutshell. So from that point, where do we stand? And when does the accountability of the government come in to say that, yes, we've learned our lesson. We've learned that this is what needs to be done when uh, when we go to court. We need not hide things because someone is a millionaire or someone is a big celebrity star. Not saying that they did hide anything. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that whatever they did to put things in motion for Robert to the point where he is capable of getting away with something 20, 30 years ago, and then now you're bringing it back up, what sense did, does that make to just continue to hide him from the world knowing that he really and truly needed the support back then? Because the government hid the conspiracy itself. The government is the conspiracy. conspiracy. The government conspired against Robert if they knew that they held things and sealed things and they allowed it to be acquitted, period. So now he has to deal with whatever he has to deal with because obviously you swept it under the rug, government. Now you want to be the, the, uh, uh, the moral ethical principle of 2022. So sad. It makes no sense. None whatsoever. So yeah, Bonjean is doing exactly what she can. She's not a miracle worker. She's not a miracle worker. Although there is greatness behind her actions. So I just want everyone to understand, to say that prayer, say that prayer for Robert that he makes it through. You know, that he makes it through. You know, 
because R. Kelly's legal team, um, I don't understand how his legal team did not request to remove jurors um, who watched surviving R. Kelly documentary on the obstruction trial. But I believe that R. Kelly's, you know, Chicago trial, you know, had reportedly been denied. Now, this is Yahoo News as of today at 3 p.m. So I guess it's official and it'll be on the docket tomorrow. R. Kelly's legal team have reportedly been denied a request to remove any potential jurors who watched the surviving R. Kelly docuseries from his new obstruction trial. The disgraced singer is facing allegations. He coerced five minors into sex acts and has been accused of producing abusive imagery. He also allegedly conspired to conceal evidence and intimidate victims. Daryl McDavid and Milton June Brown, previously employed by the uh, disgraced singer, are accused of aiding him with all three denying the allegations. As jury selection began today in Chicago ahead of a trial set to last for the next month, Judge Harry Lennonweber reportedly denied a request from Kelly's attorneys to reject members of the public who have watched any part of the Lifetime series. Surviving R. Kelly documentary first aired in 2019. The series, which later got a second season, investigated Kelly's mass of sex abuse charges According to the reports, the musician's team argued involving jurors who had watched any part of the docuseries is unfair. According to the New York Post, Kelly's attorney, Jennifer Bonjean, said no one, even a well-intentioned person, would be capable of purging his brain of information obtained through the docuseries or separating information learned from the documentary that was never subject to cross-examination from testimony introduced at trial on the same subject matter. That's just what we went over in the motion she filed yesterday. There is substantial overlap between the subject matter of this prosecution and the subject matter of the documentary. So the Chicago Tribune reported she added, allowing an individual to sit on this jury is the same thing as me standing sitting on the jury for Robert Sylvester Kelly as R. Kelly Appeal TV. It is going to be very, very devastating because I am going to find him not guilty, period, point blank, because of the um, the information that I have within me. So Bonjean is also said to have added some possible members of the jury indicated that they had watched a documentary, which she describes as absurd. The publication reported Lennon Weber denied the request, suggesting a blanket rejection would not be appropriate. Kelly was sentenced to 30 years in prison in June after being convicted of sex trafficking and racketeering charges. He was all accused of masterminding an elaborate scheme to entice and sexually exploit young aspiring singers and underage children with a jury finding him guilty last September on all nine counts, including multiple counts of racketeering. The I Believe I Can Fly singer who denied all charges was also found in violation of anti-sex trafficking law and the Mann Act. So that's where we are. I figure that it's overlapping, it's over blanketed. Let the trial go through, let him get his sentencing and work on the appeal and work to <sighs> get the trial he needs now that they will not allow him because they're allowing other things to go in because they're saying it's not double jeopardy. So I thank you so much for liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing to this podcast. I will be here from now on with clear, fresh information on premieres that you can be guaranteed to be able to listen to, hear thoroughly, and have documented information right before your eyes with no buffering. <laughs> so thank you so much and please share, like, subscribe, and we will see you next time. And as always, keep it 100. God bless you, Robert. We are down for you. We are going to keep this and keep everyone in, in the know. And we're going to let everyone know what's going on with you at any time the motion moves. All right. Peace and blessings. And we'll see you next time.